Um, now we're going into uh, the dual form of government. What, as an individual, what responsibilities do I have toward God? Well, the, the first 10 commandments. Do not worship other gods. These are paraphrased. Number two, do not make any idols. Three, do not misuse the name of God. Four, keep the Sabbath holy. Those are responsibilities that we have as individuals to God. Then we have six responsibilities as man to other people. And that's number five of the Ten Commandments. Honor your mother and father. Six, do not murder. Seven, do not commit adultery. Eight, do not steal. Nine, do not lie. Ten, do not covet. Now, do you see how each, as individuals, we have these ten responsibilities in governing ourselves? Now, these are also found in the New Testament. It's a dual form of government. We have responsibilities to God. We have responsibilities to man. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40 covers both of them. We're going to look at 37 through 38 right now. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Then the duties to man is verses 39 through 40. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So in other words, if we obey these two commandments, we don't have to worry about studying all the Old Testament law because we'll be fulfilling it as we love the Lord and as we love our neighbor. It will just flow out of us to do the right thing. But we have a tendency to either abdicate or usurp responsibility. And we'll go into this more in lesson two, to practice domination instead of dominion. Dominion is when you mind your own business, you take care of your own things. Domination is when you want to control someone else, you want to steal what they have, you want to benefit from their labor. And we can see this in slavery issues. We can see this in a lot of um, the issues that we have now where someone wants to go on welfare not work, be paid through taxes at the expense of other people. And this is something that Frederick Bastiat explains so well in the law written in 1850. And that's why we're going to really study that and how it affects a nation's economy. Fascinating, fascinating. When you read it, you'll be so excited and it'll just make so much sense and it'll line up with the word. It's really an incredible revelation. And we see this in Proverbs 16:32. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. Now, do, would we think that that's true? Don't you think that someone that can conquer a city is mighty and powerful? But here the word of God is saying, if you can rule your own spirit, you're more mighty than someone that can take a city. Amazing. Now, what we're going to go into now is responsibilities that we have from the Word of God as men and as women in our self-government. This is really interesting. In Titus 2.2, one of man's governmental responsibilities, it says that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. So this scripture is given specifically to men. If you are a young man, you should look up all these scriptures as you read the word of God. Any scripture that is spoken specifically to men, take special notice. As a man, that is your responsibility for self-government. And sober means serious, not that you can never laugh and have fun, but that you take the word of God seriously so that we choose sanctification. We choose to live by the word of God. We choose to become more like Jesus. And that's an exciting adventure. Now, women have certain governmental responsibilities. In Titus 2, 3 through 5, he says, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becomes holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober. Again, you know, not not having any fun, but serious about the things of God, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Now, isn't this amazing? Because right now we have as much divorce in the church as outside the church. 
we have almost as much abortion in the church as outside the church. So we can see that as we've fallen away from self-government, as the men are not heeding the governmental scriptures for men, as the women are not heeding the governmental scriptures for women, we are blaspheming the word of God. But isn't it exciting that we as individuals can read the word and say, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I am going to look at this scripture and I'm going to obey it. Now, when I came into being saved myself as a woman, I was very much into having the career. I wasn't going to get married. I wasn't going to have children. And so when I began to read these scriptures, it was a real paradigm shift for me. I had to let go of the traditions of men and choose to renew my mind. But I can tell you that as I've let the old things go and I've walked in as, as much as the Lord has enabled me to see it and by his grace to do it, I have so much joy and, and I have a full life. I, I wasn't going to have children. I've been able to have four children. Now I have eight children because I have four girls and four boys. There's so much joy in my life. I praise God. And I am a testimony to you that if you obey the word of God, it is not heavy. It is not drudgery. It is fun and it's an adventure. Now, why do we need to teach the women to love their husbands? Especially in our culture right now where we think of love as romantic. Oh, I love you. Um, but then maybe we hit a stone wall and we're having problems communicating. And then if we think that loving our husband is a feeling, it has to be romantic, we can say, well, I don't love him anymore. And then we're in the divorce court. But if we allow ourselves to be trained biblically, to love our husbands. We can have success in our marriage. We can have success in our families. And so the word of God speaks to this, to love their children same way. There's a certain way scripturally to raise our children and uh, to be keepers at home. Our society has taught women that it's drudgery to be at home. And I can tell you it's freedom. I don't have a boss. I can serve under my husband. My husband gives me an enormous amount of freedom. He trusts me. And so I have fun doing things out of my home, having my own business, being my own boss. These are some of the concepts that we're gonna go into. And this is freedom. This is prosperity. When you work for yourself, you are much more able to make better money than working for a boss where you're paying him most of the money. And so there is a liberty in obeying the word of God. Uh, being good, being obedient to your own husband, that's a testimony. I don't have to obey my husband, I get to obey my husband. And he, because he loves Jesus and his desire to be like Jesus, obeying him is obeying the word of God. And we make decisions together, we pray together, uh, we bounce things off of each other. And usually when we disagree on something is when we come into the greatest revelation because he'll bring something from the Lord, I'll bring something from the Lord. And as we communicate that together, we come into a higher level of victory because we're coming together and so there's victory in that um so i would encourage you to really meditate on some of these scriptures and there'll be an assignment later in this course to really get into more of this okay and so um in the word there's a specific uh call for older women to teach the younger women and this is found in Proverbs 31, 26, 28 through 30, that when she speaks, her words are wise. She gives instruction with kindness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. And he says, there's many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. So here we see that a woman who really wants to govern herself by the word of God is wise. She gives instructions with kindness. She's virtuous, which means that she does the word of God out of voluntary obedience to God. And she's capable. She really makes a difference in people's lives. And um, what an adventure. And we see in 1 Timothy 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 10, that older women are well reported of for good works. They bring up their children, they lodge strangers, they wash, it, wash the saints' feet, which means they just refresh people. They're just a fountain of blessing. Uh, they relieve the afflicted and they diligently follow every good work. And I'm telling you, when 
women get back to this scripture, the scriptural call for women. We won't need big top government. We won't need to be taxed so heavily because we'll be doing a lot of what the government's trying to do and extremely expensively just out of our own personal finance and uh, that really will benefit our nation. Now you see family governmental responsibilities in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 4, 9, Deuteronomy 6, 7, both of those scriptures are encouraging parents to raise their children. And it says to teach the commandments of God to their sons and your son's sons. Deuteronomy uh, 6, 7, thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. Thou shalt talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Just in other words, as you live your life, be teaching the word of God to your children. More instructions for family are found in Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. Each one of our children, each of us as individuals have a destiny from God and part of our education should be to train for it. Malachi 2.15, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and spirit you are his and what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart, remain loyal to the wife of your youth. So we see here a promise that as we have good marriages we'll have godly children and of course we have to work out that promise but that is the heart of God. Psalm 78, 4 through 7, I've already gone through that, but that is such a beautiful scripture that we teach God's miracles to our children so that they have the faith to trust God themselves. That's been lost in our culture, and that's something that, above all, this course will restore for you, that you will have more hope for this nation than you've ever had. Uh, more New Testament scriptures on family government, Colossians 3, 18 through 20, instructions for Christian households. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives, never treat them harshly. Children, always obey your parents for this pleases the Lord. Isn't this wonderful how much the word of God speaks to government when you look at it this way, that it's individual, then you look as a man and woman, what are my responsibilities? Now we're going into family government. It's so rich, isn't it? More scriptures uh, for children and parents. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you and you will have a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. And this is something we really need to be taught. And there's wonderful child training courses. I know my pastor and um, his wife, uh, they taught a fantastic course on child training. Um, and you could probably get that somehow if you go to gracepsl.org. I mean, one of the best courses I've ever taken. And if you, we train our children well, we won't be angry with them as much. It's much better to take the time to teach your children what they should do than to constantly have to get upset with them for their behavior that might be wrong if we're not training them. So it takes a little bit more effort to be proactive, but it yields benefits and there's a scripture that says that if we train our children well, they'll give us rest, and that's really true. It's worth being proactive, taking the energy up front, and then you reap the benefit the rest of your life because we're parents our whole life. I, I heard a joke one time, and it really cracks me up, but it's so true that this set of parents were worried about their children and decisions they were making. And it turns out that the parents were not in their 90s and the children were in their 70s. Isn't that funny? But it's true. I mean, we just always tend to be concerned about our children, even when they're adults. Okay, let me, I just, sometimes my cursor grabs my work and changes it. Okay, here we are. Um, to women within the family. Okay, this is some of the same scriptures, but we're seeing that, okay, we have responsibilities as women. We have responsibilities as wives. We have responsibilities as mothers. The scripture speaks to these three different aspects of womanhood. And so we can find it again, Titus 
2, 4 through 5. I won't go through that again because I already have um, 1 Timothy 5, 14. I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. So we can see that if women leave this beautiful calling that God's given us, it does bring reproach. The family begins to break down, issues come in. We're not as good of a testimony to the community as we really can be when we're obeying the Word of God. More instructions to women. First, Peter 3, 1 through 6, wives, in the same way, you wives must accept the authority of your husbands. Then, if some refuse to obey the good news, your godly lives will speak to them without any words. Now, this isn't saying, my pastor gave such a good teaching on this, that you never... Um, speak to your husband if you see him in error. I mean, that's being somebody's best friend to say, hey, you know, do you realize that you're having problems here? Maybe this is the reason, you know, after much prayer and much, you know, making sure you're going in the right spirit. But um, boy, if I'm doing something wrong, I sure hope somebody tells me. Um, they will be won over by observing your pure and reverent lives. That is what is going to speak to our husbands more than an occasional word if we're concerned about him. Verse 3, don't be concerned about the outward beauty of fancy hairstyles, expensive jewelry, or beautiful clothes. Isn't that a relief? You don't have to worry about all that stuff. You should clothe yourselves instead with the beauty that comes from within, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is so precious to God. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't have fun and, uh, you know, I've been told my household's very noisy. <laughs> Actually, we have a lot of fun but that quiet spirit where you're not forcing people to do things and this is something i'm learning um, that you take your own responsibilities you encourage others but you don't dominate them uh, which is so precious to god this is how the old the holy women of old made themselves beautiful they trusted god and accepted the authority of their husbands for instance Sarah obeyed her husband Abraham and called him her master. You are her daughters when you do what is right without fear of what your husbands might do. Now, I'm writing a book, Proverbs 31, for today, and I go into this in a lot more detail, but Abraham put Sarah in a harem and told her to lie to save his own skin. I mean, that would kind of tick me off. <laughs> And yet she did that and obeyed him and God blessed her. I mean, she came out a wealthy woman and God kept her safe through that. And so sometimes we get afraid of decisions that our husbands might make. Um, but how much do we trust God? Do we trust God enough to pray for them fervently and let them make some mistakes? If we don't hover over them so much, you know, we're all growing in our knowledge of God and our ability to obey Him. And so as women, that's a special call. It takes faith, uh, but it's an adventure. And I just wouldn't have it any other way. You know, before I got saved, I was always regretful that I wasn't a man. And I was talking to someone just recently and she was talking about how men have all the fun. And I felt so sorry for her because as you realize the liberty that you have as a woman, you don't covet what a man has. You're very thrilled with being able to be a woman. And I know some women that are taking this, maybe, you know, you're fully in the career. You know, I'm about to go into my career because I'm graduating my own, my last child in the spring. And I know God's called me to go into the community to teach, to teach online. And I'm very happy to do that. But there was a time where it was a full calling for me to raise my children. And my husband let me stay home. He gave me that freedom. He went out into the world to face the giants and I, you know, we lived very simply. We only had one car and we really trusted God with our finances and lived very simply. Um, but I, just a testimony that God will enable you to do it if that's on your heart and that you will prosper through it just incredibly. God is just really, really amazing and his ways are higher than our ways. Okay, these are specific scriptures to men within the family. First Timothy 5, 8, but if any provide not for his own, and especially to those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel, or in, you know that means an unbeliever. And so that's just a special responsibility to men and, you know, a lot of the times when we see young couples and they want to get married and they're all romantic, well, if you really understand scripture, you want to make sure that you can provide for that woman, that you are able to be at a place of authority because you've been responsible 
to position yourself so that you can provide for your own household. And so that gives young people a little bit of a pause before they get married. Am I ready for this? Do, am I walking in the responsibilities that I need to? Am I ready? And uh, I think as we understand these scriptures, then parents can help their children um, walk in this and really be prepared. And that's something I, we're in the midst of doing in our family is learning these scriptures and asking the Lord to help us do them. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, we've gone to this, do not exasperate or provoke. Okay, we see this as a specific scripture to men. Not uh, uh, provoke your children to anger, but rear them tenderly in the training and discipline and the counsel and admonition of the Lord. See, that's from a different version, but I love reading the different versions. You kind of get a fuller understanding. We have governmental instructions to husbands in 1 Peter 3, 7. In the same way, you husbands must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new lives. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. Now, isn't that sobering? And isn't it beautiful? It talks about men and women being equal. And this is something I think we lost with the women's movement. We don't have to struggle to be equal. We don't have to prove that we're equal. We are equal. <laughs> we are equal. We are just as important as men. But just as if you were shipwrecked on an island by yourself and you had to do everything, if one other person came, you would begin to divide the labor so that you could help each other. Same way with the roles between being a wife and being a husband. When you divide those and there's an understanding and you come under scripture, you're going to be blessed, you're going to prosper more, and it's just absolutely the way to do it. And I can speak from one who went from totally doing it the world's way to totally trusting God and being blessed through doing it God's way. He is awesome. Now, church governmental responsibilities. This speaks to Titus as a pastor over a church, as a church leader in uh, Titus 2.1. As for you, Titus, promote the kind of living that reflects wholesome teaching. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. So you see that this is the responsibility of a pastor. So this is a governmental responsibility of a church leader. Isn't that fascinating? Okay. Uh, Church, more on church governmental responsibilities um, in Titus 2, verse 6. In the same way, okay, this is again speaking to the church leader, encourage the young men to leave, live wisely. And you must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let every, oh, let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Teach the truth so that your teaching can't be criticized. Integrity. Then those who oppose us will be ashamed and have nothing bad to say about us. Do you see how the very reputation of Christ to the world depends on church leaders governing themselves according to the word of God? Verse 15, you must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them, not just read them or know them, but do them. You have the authority to correct them when necessary. Oh my goodness. So don't let anyone disregard what you say. Isn't that incredible? What responsibility our church leaders have? Let's pray for them fervently, especially as it really does seem that we're in revival. You know, we've been praying and praying and fasting and praying and praying and fasting for revival. I believe we're in revival. I have had three different uh, documented sources in the, the form of uh, DVD presentation come to me from different ministries on this exact thing. It's really amazing. I really think that this is something that God is bringing us into in a more full way. Um, from 1 Timothy chapter 2, there's several scriptures here that speak to Timothy as a pastor, as the leader of a church. It says, in every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, 
free from anger and controversy. And I want women to be modest in their parents. Okay, we read this already, verse 15, but women.